Our next speaker is Patrice Jones. Patrice is the co-founder of The Vice Sanctuary and over the years she has played a major role in different movements such as the peace movement and the LGBTQ liberation movement. In her presentation today Patrice will survey feminist, anti-racist and anarchist critiques of right-based approaches to liberation, putting forward an acu-feminist method of assessing goals and strategies for animal liberation. Uh, good morning. Uh, for those of you who haven't been uh, speaking, uh, there's something very strange that goes on when you're speaking in this particular room. Uh, not quite that much, thank you. Um, it, it, and, and it's that it's really hard to feel the audience as you're talking. It's like there's this barrier between you and, and, and the audience. Uh, so I planned this talk thinking I was going to be in room B, and I was very happy about that. Um, but we'll just have to, to make do. Um, two things before we start. Uh, one, uh, uh, not because I'm so egotistical, but just because I want to know what background people have. How many people were here when I was talking yesterday? Oh, okay. Um, so uh, today, the animal who is with me uh, is a former fighting rooster called Sharky uh, because he bites. Um, and he, uh, I was going to show you a picture because he uh, has been uh, uh, mostly rehabilitated uh, and he spends his time, uh, I live in a caravan on the site of the sanctuary and I have a work table outside that's just a pallet on some uh, cinder blocks, breeze blocks. And, uh, and so he just sort of hangs out with me while I'm working and he will be like walking around on the table while I'm think writing. And, and so he helps me think. Um, and what I'm hoping we're going to do today is uh, think a little bit uh, together. The other thing that I wanted to say by way of introduction is uh, 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 th those of you who have read my book, Aftershock, or, or heard me speak before, know that I'm uh, very uh, clear that we are animals uh, with uh, bodies um, and uh, that I don't think it's very smart or useful for us to pretend otherwise to each other. Uh, and so I will just disclose to you that I am the kind of animal who gets migraine headaches, and one of them hit me in the middle of the night last night. Uh, so I'm not thinking as clearly as I usually do, and if I start to squinch or make faces, especially if it's when you're making a comment, um, it's not about you. Uh, it's that my head really hurts, okay? Okay. So, uh, a couple of nights ago, uh, Sharon uh, was, uh, uh, from Animal Equality, was uh, uh, talking um, uh, about their campaigns and their ways of thinking and, and said some extremely smart things about uh, goals. Um, and about being very specific in, no, I have to go back up there, sorry, um, uh, uh, setting goals. And I was really happy to hear her say that. Um, and it reminded me of a, of a book that I read uh, when I was uh, first starting to teach the theory and practice of social change, which was called the... Uh, Resource Guide for a Living Revolution, um, a, a book that is in many ways very dated at this point, um, but which uh, taught me some things which I've uh, not forgotten in all of the decades since. Um, and those were uh, mm, not just goals, but also aims. Aims are the larger things you're trying to achieve. Goals are the step-by-step -step things you're going to achieve along the way to the aims, yeah? Uh, and the importance of uh, having a strategy
by which you're going to achieve those goals. Mm, and that strategy will be comprised of uh, different tactics. It's extremely important to be able to say, if only to yourself, exactly how the things you are doing are going to add up to what you want. Uh, or how your little piece, because none of, it can, none of us are going to, to save the world by ourselves, but how your piece fits into a larger strategy that you can at least imagine succeeding. Mm. I stress this because a lot of activists in this movement are pretty good on what I'm doing right now. Uh, they're really clear about what they're doing right now and, why, uh, uh, and, and they're really clear that their end goal is total animal liberation, let's say. Um, but then they go a little blurry in the middle there on exactly how handing out leaflets on the street corner telling people to go vegan. Um, it, how is that gonna, what are the steps by which that actually leads to the end of animal agriculture? There's just all this blurriness in the middle there. Do, do you hear what I'm saying? Yeah, and so I think it's really important for us to, to uh, not go blurry in the, in the middle. Um, the other thing, uh, and I'm, I'm leading towards rights, don't worry. Um, uh, 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 the other piece is that, that I learned from this book, is that we are all in our activism uh, acting on the basis of some really fundamental assumptions that we make about, uh, we might call it human nature or the way the world works, yeah? Uh, and, and very frequently, we are not aware of the assumptions that we are making. And if we examine those assumptions, we sometimes discover that we actually don't agree with those assumptions. Um, or that there really isn't a basis for it. And so, for example, uh, people will pursue animal rights uh, by means of uh, rational argumentation, arguing with people and making people see the uh, um, paradoxes in what they believe. And then if you ask them, well, do you believe that people are, are mostly guided by rationality? and that uh, 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 just showing people their paradoxes will make them change, then, then they sometimes realize, oh no, most people in my life are not quite that logical. Um, or, uh, or they might have to be shown some research which tells them that in fact people are not quite so logical and just pointing out to people the logical errors in their behavior will only for a very small portion of people uh, make them change their behavior. So it's really important, whether you stay with your assumptions or not, to make your own assumptions clear and to be rigorously critical in challenging your own assumptions. Do I really believe that? Is it really true? It, what evidence is there to suggest to me that it is true? I go to a lot of conferences, and I talk and I listen to a lot of people. Uh, uh, I mentioned yesterday the decades-long practice in activism I've had. Hmm? Um, I read a lot of books. And I talk to a lot of people when I'm at places like this and find out what they're thinking and find out what they're doing. And I sort of consider my brain to be like a location in which collective cognition is happening uh, because like I take all these things that people tell me and they go into my brain and they rattle around a bit and then they sort of start to form some patterns. 
Uh, and, and so at this stage, after 13 years in the animal movement, what I find myself doing is noticing some strengths and some weaknesses in our movement. And what I find myself doing is reaching for a new theory of animal liberation uh, that would be useful to us at this time. A theory that would be grounded, that's another word that Sharon used the other night that I thought was beautiful, that will be grounded in what I call the real. Um, I've been asking myself, what do you come up with when you start with really basic, um, what philosophers might call axioms, really basic premises, and you really think about them, uh, uh, where, do you, where, do you, where do you get to? What I'm talking about is really basic, very real facts about the world. Things like, everything happens somewhere. And the physical uh, and social and environmental aspects of those places will both um, open up some possibilities and constrict others. What about um, where things happen matters? That um, where and when cannot be separated. What if we remember that animals exist? What if we remember that the things we do or don't do matter to animals? have a actual physical impact on uh, beings who are living right now or will live very soon? What if we remember that animals have voices and use those voices and gestures and actions to express themselves perfectly clearly about what they want? What kind of theory of animal liberation do we come up with then? And by theory, I don't mean pie in the sky, I mean a way of thinking that will help us figure out what do we do? How do we come up with those strategies comprised of many different tactics that will lead us where we wanna go? Oh my gosh, and how do we figure out where we wanna go? What does remembering that animals have voices tell us about where we wanna go? Does it lead us somewhere different, maybe, than we're going right now? And so here I am at the Animal Rights Conference, right? And the Animal Rights Conference, just the very saying of the Animal Rights Conference or the Animal Rights Movement suggests to me that, the, that rights are the aim. That rights are the end goal that this movement is working for. And I'm not so sure about that. So just in case we get cut off by the time before we're done, I want to make clear that what I'm hoping to do here is to challenge, critique, introduce you to some of the critiques that have been made in other movements of the conception of rights. Not as a way of... Um, demolishing rights, but as a way of taking rights uh, and shifting it from being the aim to being one of many tactics that we sometimes use. Okay? So my, the, the end thesis of all the things I'm about to say to you uh, will be that if we're really uh, serious about animal liberation, then we won't uh, have rights as our end goal. We will use rights sometimes as a tactic, but that won't be what we're aiming for. Make sense? Okay. 
And why this is so important, again, is because these, uh, these assumptions that we make, these goals that we set for ourselves, these aims that we set for ourselves, they determine what we do or we don't do. And what we do or we don't do matters to actual animals. And so it matters whether or not rights are a useful concept, whether or not rights uh, should be what we're working for. The head is going boom, 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 boom. So, what are rights? Oh, I have to go down here. What are rights? We're here at the Animal Rights Conference. You all must be very clear about what rights are. Yes? A wild card against, oh, a safeguard against society doing something to you. Okay. So rights are something that you have to protect you from other people. Yeah, and, especially from and especially from the government, but isn't the government other people? Oh, okay. So basically rights are something that protect you from other people. Okay. This is a very common theory of rights. That's the idea that, that, that rights are... Uh, agreements among people uh, that are used uh, to protect people against each other. And this is a theory of rights that's founded within the idea that people are inherently dangerous to one another, that we're, um, we're, we're all individuals, and that it's an awful thing to have to live in a collective, uh, and you'd better protect yourself. Um, and, and in fact, that way of thinking about rights uh, is the foundation of the European US uh, democracy, uh, the social contract theory of rights. That's what underlies most of the, uh, uh, what gets called democracy. Does that make sense? Okay, any other ideas about what rights might be? Yeah. Such a strong need that it produces rules that mandate how other people have to act. Okay. Do people agree about what rights they want? Yeah, but what I mean is what rights they want for themselves. Because that's one of the things I forgot to say when I was listing animals exist and things like that. That was another one. Animals, different animals, they want different things. Frogs have some very different interests than birds. Some very different needs. Well, I don't mean to make you try and answer what's rights because if we were to take a political science course, we could spend a whole semester just unpacking the whole question of what rights might be. Uh, and we do not have the time to do that. But I just wanted to maybe make you aware that you've been using this word about which you might not even be completely clear. <clears throat> I think for most people working within the animal liberation movement, when we think about rights, we're thinking about legal rights we're thinking about rights within existing systems of government. And probably our idea of rights does have that social contract in it and maybe we never thought about how, well wait a minute, in democracy that makes sense because all of the people who are making the social contract get to vote on the social contract, but that's really just an agreement among people. So, why do animals care? I mean, some of them do, right? Uh, that are all tangled up in our laws, but I'm, I'm thinking that the migrating bird who's um, 
uh, about to starve to death next spring because of climate change doesn't much care what her legal status is within our uh, constitutions. But let's go on to critiques of rights. So, in 1971, an organization called the Chicago Anarcha Feminists uh, put out a manifesto, and uh, the uh, manifesto of the uh, Chicago Anarcha Feminists of 1971 began with these words. It has become obvious that the world cannot tolerate many more decades of rule by armed gangs of males calling themselves governments. I think that's true. Even, I mean, they were, they were, they were, they, 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 they saw that then and now. That's so true. So, why is this important to us? Well, there are a few other things that are true. Um, uh, states, countries, their places, yeah? Uh, but specifically, their places that have been demarcated through a process of violence. All of those borders on maps which establish the countries, uh, which have the laws, and which participate together in forming some international laws, all of those borders were formed by what? Wars, yes? And, and, and I think there may be one or two countries that don't have armies, but for the most part, all of those borders are uh, policed by uh, people with guns. They are inherently violent places. Furthermore, all of these countries uh, divide, further subdivide themselves into bits and pieces of private property. Hmm? And for the most part, the legal systems of those countries, while they give some um, attention to questions like uh, protecting people from one another, what it's mostly about is protecting property. And these systems of laws, how are they enforced? More gangs with guns? Yeah, okay. And I don't have time to go into it today, but feel free to read my chapter in um, an anthology called um, Igniting a Revolution um, by AK Press, or go online and listen to, on YouTube, I have a talk called The Turtle Talk, um, where I spell out exactly how and why it is that property, private property, is violence. It is a product of violence. It came to be property as opposed to nature by a process of violence, and it is maintained by violence. And so all of these, these legal systems are inherently violent. And so if our aim is in part to liberate animals from human violence, I'm not entirely sure that granting them some sort of status within this inherently violent legal system is the best end goal. I can see how, as a partial measure, uh, there are many laws that are really protecting animals and are, don't, hear, don't see me here saying we shouldn't be working for animal rights or we shouldn't be working for laws. What I'm saying is let's see that as a tactic because we understand that the whole system is inherently violent and if we're really interested in really liberating animals and I don't just mean the ones who are currently captive but also all of those who are menaced by climate change and pollution. If we're really interested, then we need to be joining the struggle against that inherently violent system of property policed by guns. 
But there's more critiques of rights. There's a critique of rights from the anti-colonial uh, position where they say, look, this conception of rights is founded in European ways of thinking about social relations. And uh, 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 if you've ever wondered sometimes where, why it is that people in uh, countries that were former colonies of Europe or of the United States resist what looks to you like democracy, and, and if you're ever tempted to go along with the world leaders who, who, who say, oh, well, those people, they just don't want democracy or they don't understand democracy. But what's actually happening is they're saying, look, we had other ways of organizing our cultures. Uh, we had other ways of organizing our uh, relations among each other uh, that did not require this particular conception of rights to protect us from each other. Uh, and we're more interested in working from our own indigenous ways. Make sense? Okay. Um, there's also a feminist critique of rights. This idea that um, we're all... Hmm. There is a... How much time do I have? Okay, so... Mm, oh boy, we've got to go fast. Okay, so uh, the, the person whose work you want to read, if you really want to understand what I'm about to say next, is uh, first a person by the name of Carol Gilligan. Carol Gilligan, like the old TV show Gilligan's Island, if anyone ever saw that. Um, uh, 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 she did some research where she came to understand that there are different forms of, that there are uh, different styles of moral reasoning. And, and that these styles of moral reasoning are gendered. They're not inherently male or inherently female. Uh, the differences between men and women and boys and girls in how they think about ethics, uh, is not because of our biology, it's because of differences in socialization, okay? So don't, don't think that it's like in our gonads. Uh, but it is the fact that uh, for the most part, at least in, the, in, in Europe and the United States, uh, uh, males tend to prefer a method of moral reasoning that is based on conceptions of justice, and on the competing interests of individuals being resolved through the application of justice. This notion of individual rights comes from the justice way of thinking. Okay? It's also, uh, I just remembered that the piece I forgot to tell you from the anti-colonial is it's highly individualistic. Many uh, uh, people uh, in collectivist cultures are much less interested in individual rights than they're interested in um, collective rights. For example, in the United States, Native Americans resisted and continue to resist the imposition of private property. They're not interested in private property rights. What they're interested in is the rights of the collective. Does that make sense? Okay. But back to women and men. So there's the justice. And it turns out that girls and women use a very different uh, tent, not all, right? With group differences, there's always some people who uh, uh, transgress the norm, um, and that's great. Uh, so I'm not saying all men and all women, not all boys and all girls, um, uh, but just a tendency. And so there's a tendency among girls and women uh, to reason by means of what's called an ethos of care. In a justice method, then uh, the goal is for justice to be served, for an abstract principle to be followed. And as long as we abide by that abstract principle, we're cool. Under the ethos of care, uh, when you are uh, trying to reason out a moral dilemma, what you're interested in doing is making sure that everybody involved um, gets their needs met somehow. Um, and that nobody is hurt too badly. The justice method, what matters is the principle. And they understand sometimes people get hurt. The ethos of care 
It's like, okay, so let's figure out how we can come up with some creative solution where everybody gets their needs met. Rights don't fit so well into the ethos of care. My suspicion is that most people in the animal protection and liberation, rights, whatever you want to call it, movements, are actually in their hearts functioning from an ethos of care, and yet somehow are in a movement that is constructing itself from this ethos of justice. All I want to say to you is just be aware that there's a critique of rights coming from the perspective of an ethos of care. Next, ah, so uh, 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 within a body of work called critical race theory in the United States, um, uh, uh, there's also been a critique of rights. You might or might not be aware that within various social justice movements, there have been lively debates about whether it is rights that we want. Um, I joined the gay liberation movement and have never considered and, and, and fought vociferously when people wanted to, uh, and did succeed in changing that to be the LGBTQ rights movement. I was never interested in rights. Um, uh, uh, within the civil rights movement in the United States, uh, 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 there, were, there were folks who were very, very, very interested in legal rights, um, but then the Black Panthers were interested in liberation, were interested in power, not so much interested uh, in legal rights, although they understood that those could be useful at times. Make sense? Uh, but so there's a lot of thinking about this question of rights and how useful is it to pursue rights? Uh, when are they good? When are they not? And uh, one theory coming out of critical race theory is that um, there always are, because legal systems are agreements among people, yes? Uh, and until very recently, there were also agreements among very small numbers of people, right? It used to be that they were just agreements among men. Agreements about men, about how we're going to protect men from each other and how we men are going to divide up the property, including the land and the women and the animals, right? And so now it's a little better, I suppose, because uh, now the, the legal system is agreement among all of the people, but we're still agreeing as people, how are we going to divide up the land and animals among ourselves and protect ourselves from each other because we're living in this inherently violent system. Um, but within critical race theory is this idea that because laws are always, and systems of rights, are always just agreements among people or some subset of people, then there are always these beings who are outlaws. They're literally outside the law. And the theory goes that there's actually quite a bit of power in the outlaw position. Animals are outlaws. Animals are outlaws at present. Animals are not, with the, with the exception of some minimal animal protection laws here, there, and a few places, for the most part, and, and nowhere, right? Is there anywhere where animals have standing as co-participants in this system of rights where they get to negotiate, if they could, be, have a place at the table and negotiate? No. So animals are outlaws, and the idea is that outlaws use that outlaw position to fight against the system When we recognize that there are outlaws, and that outlaws have a very power, that there's some serious power in the outlaw position, and that there already are beings who are outlaws, and who are using that position usefully. I'm thinking myself of baboons in South Africa who are tearing up um, housing developments. Um, and I'm thinking of elephants in India who are trampling um, uh, fields of genetically uh, modified crops. 
Um, and I'm thinking of uh, this uh, elephant who I who uh, became famous for freeing a whole group of antelope by using her trunk to open the latch and let them out of the gate uh, uh, of the corral in which the people had put them. When we realize this, then we start to see that maybe, ah, maybe, maybe, maybe the thing to do is to join the outlaws rather than to try and reform an inherently violent system. We have to recognize the reality that system is here and we might need to use it. As long as it's in power, as long as there's police, we have to take them into account. Uh, as long as there's this legal system, we're gonna need to see what we can do within it and it might be useful to do some things within it. But uh, integrating animals into that legal system, I'm not sure. I think is probably not consistent with what we really mean by animal liberation. Do we really wanna keep them from being outlaws? Or do we wanna join them as outlaws? Do we wanna be um, their allies in outlawism? And this leads me to another really big piece of my thinking with regard to animal liberation. Um, in every, in, in every social justice movement, you have people who are struggling for their own rights or liberation or however they think about it, and they get to say for themselves, right? Uh, well, nobody says uh, that... Uh, you get to decide for yourself. And then sometimes people from other groups come and join, and, and we really like that when they do. Um, uh, but it's always understood that they're joining as allies, yeah? And that they're not the ones who get to say what the goals are, right? Uh, like, uh, 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 as somebody who's lesbian, I get to participate in that process of saying what the LGBTQ liberation movement should look like. I won't always win, but I get to be part of that decision. Um, whereas, as a white anti-racist activist, what my job is is to be an ally. And it's not really for me to say, oh, this is how you should be, and these should be your goals. And you see what I'm saying? Well, we're in this weird position with animals, right? Uh, uh, because uh, most of them don't speak either English or French um, or German or Chinese um, uh, and, and we could list all of the human languages but the thing is and so uh, we I think too easily slip towards deciding that then that just means we get to decide what the animal liberation movement looks like. And we think, people will tell me, you know, oh, you're one of the leaders in the animal liberation movement. I am not. As far as I'm concerned, the natural leaders of the animal liberation movement are animals. I'm their ally. It's my job to do everything I can to figure out what they would like me to do. That means listening to them that means paying very careful attention uh, to how they express themselves and trying to figure out and learning everything I can about their interests and then trying to figure out what it is uh, that they might like uh, as their goal uh, and then figure out ways uh, to come up with strategies to do that. And uh, when, 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 when I put myself in that position as an ally of animals and then I look at this whole question of rights, and particularly when I look at the fact that rights have not proven to be particularly useful for people, when I look at the fact that, 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 that um, ah, in India there's a right to food built right into the Constitution. Children continue to starve. All around the world, it's illegal to enslave people. We all have the right not to, all of us human beings, we have the right not to be slaves. And yet there are more people enslaved than at any other po point in human history. All of us have the right not to be sexually assaulted, and yet sexual assault remains endemic. So I'm not so, so uh, from both all of these theoretical stances that I've just talked about and the practical stance, I'm not so sure uh, that rights should be our goal. But again, don't hear me, uh, I'm not somebody like Gary Francione who's like shouting at the people who disagree with me. Um, uh, or, 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 or um. 
Seriously, if he weren't so arrogant, I would feel sorry for him. Um, but, um, um, uh, 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 and I'm not somebody like Nick Cooney uh, who will tell you there's one way and only one way and it's his way to pursue things. Um, so so, so what, what, what I am here to say is that I have, a re I have a lot of questions about whether right should be our aim, but I still have great respect uh, for people who use rights as a tactic. And I think we can all uh, continue to work together uh, in a unified way um, and a fully intersectional way for real animal liberation uh, if we all come to see rights as a really useful tool to use sometimes. And, um, oh yes, and the last piece is that also, I'm not only considering myself an ally of the animals, uh, uh, but of uh, plants and ecosystems. And this is getting back to what we said before, or what I said at the end of my last talk. I'm pretty clear that the biosphere is more powerful than any of us. Uh, and certainly more powerful than all those governments. Um, and so I think that if we bring ourselves into a true alliance with non-human animals, uh, with plants, uh, uh, with uh, ecosystems, uh, that, as outlaws, that's how we can achieve um, total liberation for everybody. So that's what I had to say today. Are there any questions or comments? Thank you. Just a comment. I think you made some good points up. But uh, I think the term animal liberation is a bit problematic to use in the public because uh, there are so many people thinking, OK, people that are for animal liberation want to free all the animals out of the cages right now and um, they have no idea of animal liberation as a social movement. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think uh, it's sometimes better to use the term animal rights uh, when, uh, yeah, when in the public. Uh, that, that, yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting point. I mean, I think, I think we all have to think really, uh, it's always, I'm very pragmatic in the language that I use. Um, I, 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 for example, I hate the word vegan. Um, um, uh, I think it's confusing and made up and, and, and uh, I'm pretty sure that eggs aren't vegetables um, and that I'm a vegetarian. Um, but, um, but I am vegan, by the way. I am. <laughs> I'm just saying that as far as I'm concerned, milk is not a vegetable. Um, and so anyway, uh, but I see the utility in using that word. I understand why some people use that word. I use it in some situations. There are actually a lot of us in the States who, because people at certain levels of education have never even heard the word vegan, will we'll use vegetarian when, we're, when we mean vegan um, and then just clarify that we mean this, that, and the other without necessarily using the new word. Um, I can see why you might not want to use liberation. Um, in, I think that in the, and it may be, it may be also uh, in different countries it's different. In the States, uh, the word liberation uh, has some very positive connotations on the left. Um, I don't know if you knew uh, that in the LGBTQ liberation movement, I call it that because that's what we called it in the 70s. Uh, after the Stonewall riots, which really kicked off the radical movement, um, the first organization that sprung up was called the Gay Liberation Front. Um, and they called themselves the Gay Liberation Front in explicit solidarity with third world liberation movements. Um, and similarly, uh, within the black power movement, within the Chicano power movement, within the Native American movement, there was a lot of use of this word liberation uh, uh, as a way of solidarity with movements, uh, with, with, uh, with, with anti-colonial liberation movements. And so uh, I think in different contexts, the words are going to have different uh, meanings, but that's why I use liberation. I would totally understand why you would, particularly in certain conversations, want to use rights instead. Uh, 
Uh, thank you very much for a uh, ver very nice um, talk and different point of view. Um, I guess many of us um, didn't think this way. Um, m mostly when you say that we should be uh, allies for, for the animals. I started thinking some time ago about this point of view and there is a lady in America who is uh, teaching how to communicate with animals. Uh, I I cannot communicate with animals, so uh, can you communicate with animals and understand what they really want and how they would like to see the world? That's a beautiful question, thank you. Um, first of all, mistrust anyone in the United States who calls themselves an animal communicator with a capital A and a capital C. Um, uh, I'm sorry, no. Uh, 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 uh. I think we all vary in the degree to which we are able to read the gestures and energy of other people um, and other animals. I am somebody who's fairly sensitive uh, to the energies of other people. Um, and, and I don't just mean um, like when they're talking. Um, it, it's not working well here because I can't read your energy. Like that's why I'm up, up here and I'm moving back and forth because usually I can read energies and I can't in this particular room. Um, uh, so I think, uh, how can I put this? Okay, so Charles Darwin uh, wrote a classic book called, oh gosh, I think the title is just Emotion in Humans and Animals. Um, and what he shows uh, is something that you all know if you've ever looked at a picture of a grieving um, monkey. Uh, and it's that um, uh, because of our shared physiology, uh, because we all do come from common ancestors, we all are animals, uh, we can read each other very well without recourse to any extraterrestrial communication or, or special qualities. It's just a matter of actually paying attention. At the sanctuary, for example, roosters will uh, uh, often make an alarm cry that says they see a hawk, okay? And what I see is that not only the hens, but the ducks and the geese and the wild birds also respond appropriately. They're able to hear, here's this other species, but they're making a sound that is clearly an alarm sound. And so I think you, you don't even have to be especially sensitive to be able to see signs of distress. I can assure you, if you ever go into an egg factory, uh, you will have no doubt as to the misery of these hens. They will be expressing themselves so clearly, uh, 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 so, so part of it is just actually paying attention to the things that pretty much anybody could see if they are willing. Um, uh, facial expressions, uh, gestures, bodily movements, all of these things help us to understand what a being uh, who doesn't speak our language might be feeling. Um, we do all, just in case you didn't know, we share the basic brain uh, and nervous system uh, architecture uh, with not only all mammals, but with birds as well. Um, and uh, while birds don't have the same facial expressions we do, uh, most other animals uh, uh, share uh, some of the most basic facial expressions that we share. Um, and so paying attention to those kinds of things. The next is if you're interested in being helpful to a particular kind of animal, uh, a, a particular species, uh, then the next thing to do would be to bring yourself into um, conversation with people who do know a lot about that particular animal. And I'm not talking about, you know, vivisectionists who study them, obviously. I'm talking about maybe people who run sanctuaries. I didn't used to be able to figure out uh, what chickens are feeling, but now I'm a lot better at it. And that's just from spending years and years with them and, and, and paying attention. Um, and so if I hadn't been that person and I wanted to know something about chickens, then I would call Karen Davis of United Poultry Concerns, who I know has been caring for chickens for decades. And I would ask her, what do you think um, about this 
uh, particular thing that uh, we think would be helpful to chickens. Based on what you know about chickens, do you think that chickens would actually find that helpful? Does that make sense? Did I answer your question, Debrugia? Yeah. And, and, and I always know what Sharky's feeling because he bites me if he's mad. One last question, maybe? Hello, good, um, good afternoon. Um, I totally agree with everything, pretty much everything you were saying. I think you've got it right, 100% right, everything that, you, everything that you've been saying, you know, about, um, you know, whether to look at it as rights or, um, or, li or as liberation. I, 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 go, I, go, I go with Dr. You know, Dr. Steve's best concept to total liberation, not that it's his concept, but I think that embodies pretty much, you know, every rights movement, roughly thereabouts, you know, um, against prejudice in general, you know, those kinds of evil prejudices, you know, that demoralise others and, you know, exploit others, you know, so I go for total liberation there um, to escape that bit of stigma as well, I think, you know, rights or veganism or liberation, you know, so blah, 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 if you get my message there. But... Um, what I'd like to say also is thanks for raising that point about um, Professor um, Gary Francione because I don't think he, I didn't feel that he answered my question um, yesterday where I was asking him a question about, you know, whether, you know, he believes that we're right to break the law in some situations like um, Gandhi when he, lived, when he brought the law, did the salt march and so on and so on. And he gave me every other possible answer he could find, but I don't think I don't feel, I don't think he, I don't feel that he felt he answered my question um, very, very directly. Then you know it was all indirect. But and another thing I'd like to just rem I think when Steve was on stage last time, and you asked him a question, he said, "Don't worry, Steve, fem the feminists are coming to save you." And then, you know, then you started talking about um, when you put women into power, you were saying you, you reduce the population because you know we're putting on to climate change and things like that. And you say, when, you put women in, when we put women in power, we reduce the pop. You know, women will have less children and so on and so on. So I think you were saying there's, there's ways of um, controlling, you know, natural ways of controlling things and so on and so on. Um, and you said you were going to talk a bit more about that. And you might have done because I've not been in here um, all, all the time. So you might have covered what you wanted to cover there anyway. But I was just going to remind you, you did say that you were going to speak a little something about that, you know, putting women in power. And I think we should put you in power because I think you've got a lot of knowledge and sense, you know, we need to put in people like women like you in power and so on and so on and so on. And that's about it. Yeah, well done. Thank you. You're brilliant. Champion. <laughs> What's more a comment than a question? I would okay, we have to finish here. But I guess you're around outside. <laughs>